Counting is fun. It's where math started. And an interesting problem is to count primes. How many primes are below a hundred, or a thousand, or a million? And instead of the integer primes, we could also count polynomial primes. How many polynomial primes are linear, or quadratic, or cubic? But the answer is just infinite if we're using regular integer polynomials. It's more intriguing to count the polynomial primes mod 2. In this case, there's a finite amount of polynomials of each size, so we're able to count which ones are prime. And this problem is pretty tricky, but it turns out that instead of counting polynomials, we can count necklaces, which makes the problem a lot easier. And at first, this connection is not obvious. But by studying the necklaces, we can gain a deeper understanding of these prime polynomials. So let's find the primes in the polynomials mod 2. And we'll start with the constants. There's just 0 and 1. Just like in the integers, these are special cases. They're neither prime nor composite. So we'll just ignore them and move on to the linear polynomials. We have x and x plus 1. And both of these are prime. We can't break them down. So there are two prime linears. But instead of linear, we'll call these degree 1, where degree is the highest power, which makes labeling easier. In degree 1, there are two primes. So now let's move on to the degree 2 polynomials. There are four of them. The two on the left are just made of x's, so they're composite because we can factor out an x. What about the other ones? The top is also composite. If we plug in 1, we get 0, so 1 is a root, which means we can factor out x minus 1. But that's the same as x plus 1, so we get this factorization. So that just leaves us with x squared plus x plus 1. 0 is not a root, and neither is 1, so this has no linear factor. But a composite would need a linear factor, so this is prime. Degree 2 has 1 prime. Next, let's move on to degree 3. There are 8 polynomials. Just like before, the ones on the left are only x, so they are composite. On the right, the top and bottom have 1 as a root, so we can make a factorization, and they're also composite. And that just leaves us with these two. They have no linear factor, but they would need one to be composite, so they're prime. But before we mark this down, let's rethink this process. What we've done so far is to find the polynomials, and then check for factorizations. But as the degree gets higher, this is going to get more tedious. Our goal is just to count the primes. So we really just need to count the polynomials, and then count the factorizations. So let's try this approach for degree 3. How many polynomials are there? This is the general form for degree 3. Each of the coefficients can either be 0 or 1. So there are 2 cubed, or 8, total polynomials. Now, of these 8, what are their prime factorizations? They could either be a degree 1 times degree 2, or 3 degree 1s, or just a degree 3. So let's start with the first case, and recall the counts we've found so far. There are two degree 1 primes, and there's one degree 2 prime, so that's two total polynomials with this form. Next, there are two options for each degree 1 prime, but that would take up all eight. This causes duplicates. We're counting these two factorizations separately, but they're really the same. We can avoid this duplicate problem if we use a divider, with the x factor on one side and the x plus 1 on the other side. So if we put the divider here, they are all x. If we move it here, we get an x plus 1, and then another, and then another. So there are four possible positions for the divider, meaning there are four polynomials with this kind of factorization. And finally, how many are just degree 3? How many are prime? Well, we have 8 total, and then we'll subtract the 2 of this type and the 4 of this type to get two polynomials. Degree 3 has two primes. And this matches what we saw before. So now let's apply this to degree 4. There are 2 to the 4, or 16, total polynomials. And these are the possible factorizations. 
First, there are five positions for a divider, so that's five polynomials of this form. Next, there are three positions to divide the degree once, and there's just one option for degree two, so that's three total. Next, there's just one option for degree two, so there's just one here. And then each of these has two primes, so that's a total of four. So to count the primes, we subtract each of these from 16 to get three. Degree four has three primes. And now we could continue with degree five, but let's not actually calculate this. We've been focused on the polynomials mod two, but we could also look at mod three, or five, or seven, or any prime p. So now let's look at this general case. But why just the prime moduli? Well, if we use a composite like mod six, we can get a weird result like this, where a degree three times a degree two equals a degree two, because the degree five term has disappeared. But if we use a prime modulus, we'll always get a degree five as expected. And this is because the integers mod p are a field. A field has the nice property that if a and b are non-zero, then a times b is non-zero. There's no disappearing acts. We write this field as f sub p, and the polynomials like this. So now, let's count the prime polynomials over f sub p. But actually, we're just gonna count the monic prime polynomials, which means that the leading coefficient is one. In f sub five, there are 20 polynomials of degree one. Here they all are. But we only need to study the monic polynomials because everything else is just a scalar multiple of something monic. So if we find that a monic is prime, then all of its multiples will also be prime. The fact that f is a field tells us that scalar multiplication doesn't affect primality. So let's do it. Let's count the monic primes, starting with degree one. This is everything x plus a, and a has p options since we're working mod p, so there are p monic polynomials, and they're all prime. Next, for degree two, we have p options for each coefficient, so there are p squared polynomials and each of these either has a factorization into degree ones or their prime. So how many are composite? Well, we can use the divider method, but actually we now need p minus one dividers since there are p options to choose from. So how many ways can we arrange the dividers? Well, there are p minus one dividers and two factors, so that gives us p plus one total positions and we need to choose two positions for the factors, so the answer is p plus one choose two. There are p plus one choose two composite polynomials, and that turns out to be p squared plus p over two. So to get the primes, we take the total, subtract the number of composites, and we're left with p squared minus p over two. So that's the number of primes in degree two. Moving on to degree three, we have p cubed polynomials, and these are the options for factorization. For the first type, there are p minus one dividers and three factors, so that's p plus two total positions, and we need to choose three positions for the factors, so that it gives us p plus two choose three, which is this. Next, there are p options for the degree one factor and this many options for the degree two, which gives us this. So to get the number of primes, we subtract these from the total, leaving us with a third of p cubed minus p. And now you may be noticing a pattern, a half p squared minus p, a third p cubed minus p, and if we continue, we get a fourth p to the fourth minus p, and then a fifth p to Excuse the fifth me. minus p. Excuse me, this is wrong. That's supposed to be a p squared. The pattern is not that easy. In degree six, we have this many primes. Why? It helps to think about necklaces. The monic primes of degree n in the polynomials mod p correspond to aperiodic necklaces with n beads using p colors. For example, these are the two primes of degree three mod two, and there are two aperiodic necklaces with three beads using two colors. But before we ask why these are linked, let's count the necklaces. 
instead of the polynomials mod p, we'll use p colors. And instead of degree 1, we'll just use one bead. So there are p necklaces, one for each color. And they're all aperiodic. Next, with two beads, there are p squared necklaces. But we notice the ones on the diagonal are periodic. They repeat the same color. There are p of these, one for each color. So we need to subtract p to get the aperiodic necklaces. But then we also notice there's duplicates. These two are the same. They're just rotated copies of each other. So to get rid of these duplicates, we remove half of the necklaces, leaving us with the unique aperiodic necklaces. And this formula is the same we saw with the polynomials, 1 half p squared minus p. But getting here was a little more intuitive. Next, let's look at the three bead necklaces. There are p cubed total necklaces. p of them will be periodic, one for each color, so let's subtract those. And then we will have duplicates based on rotation, so we just want to take a third of them. Again, this is the same formula we saw with the polynomials. And I think it's important to note that the necklaces can rotate but not flip. So these are not considered the same necklace. You may feel like these should be considered the same. Next, let's look at the four bead necklaces. These could either repeat with period one, period two, or period four, in which case they're aperiodic. But instead of thinking about the period, I find it helpful to think of this as having four copies, this has two copies, and then this just has one copy. And this helps us because we can reduce this case from four copies into two copies of a larger thing. And so we can group all of the periodic necklaces together as two copies of a two bead necklace. And there are p squared two bead necklaces, so there are p squared of these. So that means that there are p to the fourth minus p squared aperiodic necklaces. And then we just take a fourth of them to get rid of rotations. And to help us understand this further, let's look at a larger case, 18 beads. We can either have 18 copies, or 9, or 6, 3, 2, or 1. And we notice all of the periodic ones are divisible by 2 or 3, because those are the primes that divide 18. So each can be represented as either two copies of 9 beads, or three copies of six beads. To count the aperiodics, we start with the total p to the 18, and then these can have two copies of nine beads, so we subtract them out as p to the nine, and these can have three copies of six beads, so we subtract them out as p to the six. But now we should notice 18 and six got subtracted out twice, because they can be represented as six copies, and six is divisible by both two and three. So to counteract this, we need to add back in p cubed for three beads. And this gives us the correct total. We just need to divide by 18 to get rid of rotations. More generally, if we have n beads, where n is divisible by primes p1 through pk, we start with p to the n, and then we subtract out each power of n over a prime. But then we've subtracted too much, so we need to add back in each power of n over two primes but then we've added too much, so we need to subtract out n over three primes, and we continue this back and forth until we have hit all of the primes. And then, of course, divide by n to get rid of rotations. And this gives us a count for the necklaces. This is called a necklace polynomial. But of course, it's not just the necklaces. This also applies to the monic primes mod p. And now it's time we finally ask why. What is the link between monic primes and aperiodic necklaces? Well, the short answer is, they aggregate in the same way. To illustrate this, let's look at all of the four bead necklaces in two colors. And notice that here, rotations are distinct. These are being counted separately, although they're just rotations. We can generate these from aperiodic necklaces. So this one bead aperiodic repeats to give us this necklace, and the same with the other one bead aperiodic. This two bead aperiodic gives us two necklaces based on its two rotations, and this four bead aperiodic gives us four necklaces based on each of its rotations. The same goes with this one and with this one. 
These aperiodics combine to create all 16. Now to carry this over into the polynomials, instead of creating the set of four bead necklaces in two colors, we'll create the polynomial x to the two to the four minus x. It has this factorization. Each of the degree one primes contributes one degree, the degree two prime contributes two degrees, and each of the degree four primes contributes four degrees. So they combine together to make a whole in a similar way. Both count up to 16. And you may be wondering, where does this factorization- The answer is pretty technical, so I'll make it brief. These degree four primes have the same splitting field, k. The order of k is two to the four, which means that the multiplicative group is a two to the four minus one cycle. And that means that every non-zero is a root of this polynomial. So multiplying by x, we also get zero as a root. x to the two to the four minus x has every element as a root. <sighs> to summarize, for every d that divides n, every aperiodic d bead necklace contributes d necklaces to the set of n bead necklaces. And similarly, every degree d monic prime contributes d degrees to the polynomial x to the p to the n minus x. And that is why counting them gives the same answer. That was a lot. Thanks for sticking through that. There are also some interesting results that we get if we look at the prime factorization of these necklace polynomials, but this is quite abstract and requires prior knowledge of cyclotomics, so let me know if you'd actually be interested to learn about this.